This session we are starting with a group of verses from chapter 4 that we call samskaras. So this group of verses from 9 to 13 talks about samskaras. The last time when we left off we talked a little bit about karma and we said there's black karma, white karma and mixed karma. And this goes now into samskaras. So I hope that everybody knows the difference between karma and samskaras. Very often people use them in interchangeably. It's, they have two different meanings. Karma is the action. And the action springs from samskaras. Samskaras are the impressions in the mind. And so due to certain impressions, there's action and then that action will strengthen the impressions creating a vicious cycle so the very first verse in this group which is verse 9 says there's a cause effect relationship even though they the vasanas are separated by birth space or time because memory and samskaras are same in form. So what this verse is saying is that samskaras are basically memory. It's a form of memory. It's like in the computers, you have memory. And you too have memory where everything is stored. So all the impressions that you have received from birth and before are stored there. And even if there's a separation in time, birth or space, it does not matter. Birth, for example, you have impressions collected from many different births, many, many different births. However, it's the last two words that are responsible for this particular body that you have. So while the samskaras of many births are stored, the last two births are responsible for the body that you have now. During meditation, deeper meditation, some sadhakas may come in touch with these ancient memories. The initial experience can be quite disturbing, but these memories are very diffuse. You may not remember necessarily specific things, but very general. We have heard about stories about rebirth, that there are children that remember their past, and it is actually not so infrequent. It happens more often because around the age of two or three, when the children start talking and communicating, their memories are still fresh. They have not been socialized by their surroundings, and they still do remember things from their past. But it happens very often that when the children start talking about these stories, adults think of these stories as just made up, made up stories. Or they get very scared and they give the child the impression that he should not talk about these things. It's forbidden or it's somehow bad to talk about this. And so this is then forgotten by the child after some time. Some of you know the story of the Dalai Lama, that it was a tradition that they would find the next Dalai Lama by intuition, finding the child who would select his personal belongings. So the child would find the personal belongings of the previous Dalai Lama, in that way showing that he was the Dalai Lama reborn in a new body. So these vasanas separated by space or time does not matter because they are just like 
memories. So you may find that birth is an animal. There's a certain blueprint, you know, you have a birth is an animal. And this blueprint is existing in you as well. And so theoretically, one can be also reborn as an animal, but that would be unusual. Generally, the spiritual evolution is upwards, going to higher levels of consciousness. And very rarely does one fall from a human body into an animal body again. That would mean that you have very strong animal tendencies, which were then strengthened further in this body. Any questions about this particular verse? Verse 10 is quite interesting. I'm sure that most of us are able to relate to it. The will to live being everlasting, it follows that the impressions, the vasanas, from which it arises also has no beginning. Now, most of us have not had a very close experience of death. But those people who have had a close to death experience or a near death experience, they know that during that time, the soul, the mind clings on desperately to the body, does not want to leave. And however old you may be, However broken the body may be, one still tends to cling on to it. Even animals feel a sense of fear when death approaches. You've seen that in slaughterhouses, how the animals seem to sense death. They smell it and they panic and they are in a terrible state of fear. So how do the animals know what is death? Why are they afraid of it? These are unconscious impressions in the mind. These are memories, memories of death. And it is because of these memories that the fear arises again. So you see, even though it is separated by birth or time or space, it does not matter. The memory of fear remains. Little children, for example, they, they know unconsciously what death is. No parent really explains death to a little child, but the child knows what death is. But really at a young age. And if you talk about death, they don't like it. And the reason for that is that there is a memory, unconscious memory, a deep samskara. Deep samskaras, very ancient memories, are called vasanas. In the Vyas Bhasya, it also explains that the body or consciousness keeps expanding. I just mentioned that, that one moves towards higher levels of consciousness. One really falls back into animal states. So the mind and consciousness seems to expand. The example given is that of a little lamp in a small pot. And if you break the pot, the light is in the entire room. So consciousness expands in this form and then again has to go back into another body. Mind can expand 
and move to the next level of consciousness through external means like worship, charity, good deeds. But even better are good samskaras such as compassion, friendliness, or noble qualities. Any question about this verse? Okay, before I move on to the next verse 4.11, I'd like to make an announcement. Some of you may have seen it already. It's on Facebook group, the that for Satsang group, where I asked if you would prefer to have the meetings on a Saturday, same time, but on Saturday, and we got an overwhelming response for that where I think about almost 20 people or more said they would prefer to have the meetings on Saturday. So from next week we will have our meetings same time on Saturday. I hope that's convenient for everybody here as well because I think some of you are not in that group. The timing will remain the same. Oh, Jenny, it was just you for Friday, is that? Okay. So I hope Saturday works as well. Good. I'm glad that Saturday seems to work better for almost everybody. And uh, maybe we also have more participants then, because I, I am aware that a lot of people have been watching this on YouTube. and some. To my pleasant surprise, even watch it again on YouTube, having watched it live. So that's a very nice uh, feeling. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Jenny, if you can't uh, manage, then of course you can catch up on the channel. That first English. All right, so we can move on to verse 11. Verse 11, very interesting, very practical. Vasanas are bound together as cause, effect, and as stratum, substratum, object. Vasanas disappear in their cause and substratum disappear. Well, that sounds complicated, but in fact, it's not all that complicated. There's cause, effect. When there are vasanas, there's an effect, and the effect strengthens the cause again. And then the vasana disappears, the, the disappears when the cause and the substratum disappears. Substratum is, is being fed here in this environment, and it grows in this environment. So the objects and everything around also strengthen the vasanas. Especially important to understand is how this vicious cycle strengthens. If you have virtuous actions or, or samskaras, impressions, this will give you happiness. But happiness leads to attachment, right? Because everybody wants to be happy. So there's attachment, which creates an effort, greater effort, speech, mind, body, puts an effort to have more happiness, creating more beneficial samskaras, leading to virtuous samskaras, and again to happiness and attachment. So that's one part of the cycle. The other part of the cycle is when you have evil samskaras. Evil sounds strong, but evil is also things like jealousy, 
or anger. And we have this or manipulating people, you know, trying to get something you want, lying for something that you want. These are evil actions or samskaras. These lead to misery. Misery leads to hatred. And that strengthens it further to create more injurious and evil actions. So that's how the cycle, this cause effect is always strengthened. The same process is seen with desire or karma. Karma is called desire. When the desire is fulfilled, it leads to pride, to attachment, and to greed, which in turn leads to egoism or hankara. The desire is not fulfilled, it leads to frustration, anger, and jealousy, which again strengthens the hankara. So, you see, desire is a very difficult thing to manage, whether you fulfill or not fulfill the desire, you do end up strengthening the ego or ahankara. This is, of course, when all this is done unconsciously. It's different when you do something consciously. So you can break this cycle by learning to let go of these thoughts. Now, when we talk about let go, people think, okay, I have to just let go. I stop thinking about this. But that ends up in suppression. Letting go is a skill that one needs to learn during meditation. It means sitting with the thoughts and not being affected by them, not being disturbed by them, not getting involved into them, not following that train of thought and, and losing yourself in it. This is letting go. And when you have learned that, you begin to also introspect and decide then which thoughts you want to strengthen and which thoughts you will let go. So if you have some noble qualities, good qualities, selfless qualities, you would strengthen these. And if you have negative evil qualities, such as habit or tendency to to put yourself down to imagine that whatever you do is not good or is is bad or it's not good enough that for example would be a negative quality and you learn to let go of that and finally we learn to witness in which you are then beginning to be identified no longer with ego or with manas but with pure consciousness so you're slowly learning to see the duality clearly so that was verse 11 these are the cycles of vasana causing with cause and effect and these are very important to understand. They are very practical and you can observe these in your daily life all the time. Simple thing like you eat a dessert, ice cream, cake and it gives you happiness, pleasure. You want to have more. You have too much. <laughs> you get sick. So these kind of cycles are basically our mind patterns, vrittis, habit patterns. And so the vasana then appears at the surface level in the form of habit patterns. Any questions regarding vasanas?
So another short announcement. Um, if any of you is not a member of that first satsang group on Facebook, it would be a good idea to join. It's very possible that in the next few months we might stop having the GoToMeeting platform and have the meetings live on Facebook instead in the group. It's just an idea that we are toying with. It's not really clear yet. So all the same, it's a good idea to be a part of the group if you're not, so that you are informed about announcements like change of time or canceling cancellation of meeting in case um, I have to cancel on short notice. And of course to participate in some nice discussions. Verse 12. The past and future are present in the fundamental form, there being only difference in the characteristics of the forms taken at different times. Most of us know this and understand this intuitively. As a person, right now, you are because of your past. The way you think, the way you are, is basically all present in that past is still there in this body and this form, this mind that you have. And the future is also present in the form of samskaras which have to still manifest. So the past that you were when you were a child, now as an adult, and the future as an old person, these are just differences the characteristic of the form. So the characteristics are basically another word for samskaras. So this actions of your future will be determined by your present actions. All are motivated by samskaras. Now the samskaras characteristics are Manifest, subtle or latent, and they are of the nature of gunas. For this, we can have a look at our diagram. And we see that when we talk about samskaras being manifest, they're manifesting here, the conscious mind and a force at the body level, and in the world in the form of actions. So their manifest form is out in the world. What is the subtle form? The subtle form is here in the active unconscious mind. So when you're in the dream state and you have these images, these are some scars. So you have a frightening dream. You're afraid of something, a snake. That is now manifesting in a subtle form or it is latent in the latent unconscious mind which means it's like a seed it's not active yet so basically this is what it is talking about in this verse And of course, while they are manifest, subtle or latent, these are all gunas. These are all rajas, tamas and sattva. I think all of you know what rajas, tamas and sattva is. They are qualities. Tamas is that which is dark, heavy. Rajas is that which is active dynamic and sattva is calm but it has of course its own term in, in understanding in the metaphysics Sankhya metaphysics and we see that everything is built up of tamas rajas and sattva it's a bit like the atoms you know a bit like the electrons neutrons and protons you can say they are qualities which make up everything in the world. 
so are the gunas, seen from a more philosophical point of view. So all objects are made up of the gunas. And verse 14 says, on account of coordination of the gunas, an object appears as a single unit. This group of verses, 4.14 to 17, is about how the mind perceives the objects. So we just said the objects are made up of three gunas. Yet we don't see them like that. We just see one single unit. So if you see an apple, for example, there's light, there's texture, there's, there's different qualities. But you just see an apple and you don't give too much thought to all these other qualities. So it is with all objects. They are made up of these three basic qualities. But we perceive it only as one single unit. Verse 15. Though the object is the same, there being different minds, they, the object and its knowledge, take different paths. Well, this is a very interesting verse because it really tells us something very fundamental about the way each person perceives the world. So two people can look at the same dog and one person will say, oh, how cute, what a cute little doggy. The other person will be totally terrified. And why is that? Because one has had very positive experiences with dogs and the other one not. So though the object, in this case the dog, was the same, different minds will perceive it differently. So we can take a thing as simple as a knife. When a surgeon looks at it, he sees a very useful instrument that saves lives. But when a dangerous criminal looks at it, he sees a weapon. So, everything we look at, we see out of this filter of our own samskaras. And therefore, while we all live in a similar surrounding, all these people living in a similar surrounding will still see and understand the world differently. Some of you may have had this experience, it's kind of cute and funny. You may even go for a movie with somebody and you come back out of the movie with the other person having a totally different story and a different understanding of what the movie is about. So this is because we see things so differently, because we have different experiences and this has led to different samskaras and kleshas in us. It's a filter. None of us really are seeing the world the way it really is. Most of the time we are seeing it through our filter of deep fears and attachments and aversions. And this leads to a very unique way of looking at things. Any questions about this verse? Verse 15 is a nice little clue about why the world is such an interesting place. If everybody would see the world exactly the way it is, then the world would come to an end very quickly. Verse 4.16, oh, there's a question, yeah? Rakesh, could one relate this to the Bhagavad Gita as the field and the knower of the field? Um, yes, uh, 
the field is of course different for for everybody and uh, the knower of the field is of course pure consciousness so yes it is it is that it's very much that so verse 4.16 an object is not dependent on one mind if it were so then what would happen to it when it is not cognized by that mind so if you see any object around you you see it but somebody else doesn't see it so while i'm sitting here and i'm looking at my laptop none of you are here to look at my laptop but this laptop does not just depend on my mind to exist it has its own existence now this verse confirms worldly existence or duality as a reality now this is very different from the philosophy school of philosophy which is advaita which says everything is an illusion and that if it weren't for for us actually this world doesn't exist it's just an illusion so this shows us that sankhya yoga sutras is a school of philosophy which is based on duality and not advaita so it's a dvaita school <clears throat> or to be more precise it's dvaita dvaita that means it accepts both that there is the non dual self as well as the duality both exist so we come to verse 13 verse 13 is <clears throat> similar to verse 15 an object is known or unknown to the mind according to the color of the mind so we saw in verse 15 that we talked about the dog and somebody sees it as cute and somebody sees it as scary so also an object is known or unknown to the mind to depends also on on the mind for example if you go to a supermarket you may not really notice so much the section about um, baby foods for example if you don't have any babies or if you are an alcoholic every shop you go you would probably see bottles of wine and an alcohol because that's what your mind is colored with some of you women may know that phenomena that when pregnant women they see pregnant women everywhere you keep seeing everywhere pregnant women or babies so this is because of the coloring of the mind so we are attracted to certain things or feel aversion towards certain things because of coloring the clichés basically any questions about this section on mind perceiving objects okay we go to verses 18 to 21 and this is about the mind itself as an object so in the first group of verses which we just talked about we talked about the mind perceiving the objects but now the mind itself is the object and how is that possible verse 18 on account of the changelessness of purusha the master of the mind the ripples in the mind no this no so who is the master purusha 
Purusha is another word for your consciousness, center of consciousness, or Atman. The word Atman comes from the Vedas or from Upanishads, Vedanta philosophy. The word Purusha comes from Sankhya philosophy, but it is essentially the same. So on account of the changelessness of Purusha, the master of the mind, the mind is always known. So Purusha is the master and the mind is serving the master. And the master is always, he knows the mind. It may not seem like that to you because We are not established in the self. And if you were established in the self, you would know all the ripples of the mind. The word ripples here, the vrittis of the mind, the fluctuations in the mind. Now the purusha seer remains constant and therefore can know the mind. But if this purusha were changing, it's not possible to know the mind. To know a location, for example, we need a constant frame of reference. If I say that I live near New York, that's fine. That tells me immediately, and tells all of you, where New York is. And, and you know, okay, it's somewhere around New York. But if New York would keep moving, then you would know where New York is, right? And you wouldn't know where this person is living. Because... New York itself is moving. It's totally absurd, of course. So there is a foundation or something that has to be constant. So you have a frame of reference. And then you have Purusha, which is constant and unchanging. Then you can know the mind with reference to this unchanging Purusha. So the mind is not self-illuminating because it is an object or a knowable. So we can go to our diagram here. And we see that the So the, this part here, the center of consciousness that remains unchanging, the mind itself here can keep changing the body. It also changes. You were a child, you were a teenager, you became an adult, and you will also grow old one day. The mind also keeps changing. First, when you were a child, you had very different interests. You wanted to have toys and... You play different kind of games with your friends. You became a teenager, you have completely different interests. You wouldn't be caught dead with a toy. And so both these change, body as well as mind. Only center of consciousness does not change. And it is with reference to center of consciousness that we understand that the rest of it is continuously changing and this is not. And we can see from that that the, this part here is not illuminated in the sense that center of consciousness is illuminated. It has light. While the rest of it, the mind, the body, does not have that light or life. That life which you see in the body in the mind is reflected light. It comes from the center of consciousness.
So you saw in that diagram that the mind itself was an object then. When you are established in the center of consciousness, the mind itself is an object. So this is a bit like the sun and the moon. The, to go back to the diagram again. We see that this is like the sun. It has a light of its own. And this part, this is like the moon. This is this a little bit of light here. And then these are the phases of the moon. You can say it expands in consciousness as you become more conscious. So it's like the moon which is waxing, growing, brighter. And that's why we say that the light of the mind is reflected light. It has no light of its own reflects the light from the center of consciousness, which is like the sun. And so in this context here, when we speak of with reference to the center of consciousness, then the mind appears to be an instrument. But when we speak of with reference to the body or objects outside, it appears that the mind is, these are the objects, the worldly objects are the objects and the mind is the knower. And that's what the average person thinks. The mind is the knower. But in reality, it's not the mind that is the knower. It is the center of consciousness that is the knower, the cognizer. And the mind is merely an instrument. Any questions about that? <clears throat> Verse 20. Because the mind cannot know itself and its objects simultaneously. So, some of you may have observed this. If you are reading a book or you are watching a, a film, it's very hard to, to watch your own thoughts, feelings and reactions at the same time. You cannot seem to do both. Either you know the book or the, the film or you are observing yourself and know yourself. So the mind cannot do that. It, it cannot know itself and the object. But Purusha can. The center of consciousness can do that. When the mind is not cloudy, it has been purified, the center of consciousness starts shining through and we acquire the ability to witness, to know the mind as well as the external objects simultaneously. That what the mind cannot do. Verse 21, if one mind illuminates another mind, then Buddhis would cognize Buddhis, leading to an absurd conclusion and intermingling of memories. Now this verse is more a bit like, you know, uh, an intellectual verse. For From our diagram, it's very clear that the mind has no qualities to illuminate it is pure consciousness that has that illuminating quality. But here, it's almost like it's answering <clears throat> a question posed by an intellectual who would say, yes, but what if another mind illuminates this mind? Well, it's not possible because the mind itself is not self-illuminating and another mind cannot illuminate then this mind because 
would these would cognize for this. It's it's an absurd kind of discussion. Some of the verses in the chapter four may have actually been a bit in response to some of the the I <clears throat> the ideas of the Buddhist school of thought, known as Shunyavada. So the time the Yoga Sutras were written, there were a lot of debates between the Buddhists or the Shunyavadas and the those following Sankhya or Sanatana Dharma. And so it is very possible that some of these verses have been added on as a response to such questions. So verse 22. Then universal consciousness takes on the likeness of buddhi and becomes the cause of the perceived consciousness of buddhi. So buddhi is the closest thing in the mind that is to pure consciousness. It is similar, but it's not the same. We can call upon buddhi, that's our inner voice of wisdom, for guidance, remembering that this is not the goal, because buddhi is the servant. It serves pure consciousness. It is similar has the likeness of universal consciousness. It is sentient. It is conscious, but it is not pure consciousness. It is still in the mind field. And this is actually the, the root of our ignorance, the definition of avidya is when we begin to think that buddhi is, in fact, your consciousness, when it is not. And that's what we're doing all the time. In fact, some, most people are not even aware of buddhi. They are more at the level of manas or ahankara. Those at the level of manas are busy with the external objects of the world. Those who are at the level of ahankara are, are busy playing power games and building up their egos. So most of us are not operating at the level of buddhi. Any questions about verse 22? Verse 23 says, The mind being colored by the seer as well as the seen is all comprehending. We have seen our diagram clearly, and it shows us that the mind is here in the center of this diagram. On one side is the body, and on the other side is the center of consciousness. And when I say body, I include the world. It's Anna Maya Kosha. Anna is food or body related to the body. So extension of the body is the world and all the objects. So it's somewhere here in the middle. And now if we go back. And we see what it says. It says that the mind is colored by the seer as well as the seen. So the mind is affected by the seer because it gets the light from the seer. But it is also colored by the external objects. When it is directed outwards, it appears to be the subject because it's looking at the objects when it is inward focus it appears to be the object because the pure consciousness itself is the object subject 
So it depends on the perspective. It is colored by both. And this mind is all comprehending. That's verse 23. I'm guessing that we're going to finish the, the Yoga Sutras in the next session because now we are at verse 24 and we have in this last chapter only 34 verses. So we will finish the Yoga Sutras next session, which will be on a Saturday. Any questions so far? Any general questions? Okay, in that case, <clears throat> verse 24. The mind, though diversified by vasanas, serves the Purusha, for it acts in association with Purusha. So, it has been mentioned again, <clears throat> that the mind has got so many vasanas, so many impressions, so it's very divided. And so even though it is divided, it's very clear that it is serving Purusha and it acts always in association with Purusha. It cannot act without Purusha because then without Purusha, the body is dead. There's no light, there's no life. So it always serves Purusha or pure consciousness. These samskaras, these vasanas, they have no other purpose than enlightenment or liberation. It is for us to deal with these kleshas or samskaras or desires and purify the mind to be liberated. That is the goal or purpose of life. He may have other little goals, such as getting married, having children, whatever, getting a job, all these little goals, but there is one big purpose or big desire to be liberated, which swallows all these small desires and asanas. Verse 25. For one who has realized the distinction between Purusha and Buddhi, for him the inquiries about the nature of Purusha cease. This is an important verse. So once you have understood that buddhi is not purusha, and when I say understood, I'm not referring to understood as in intellectually understood, but having seen that difference through direct experience, when that has happened, you no longer need to inquire about the nature of purusha. A lot of people like to have intellectual discussions about the nature of Atman or Purusha or pure consciousness. They are neo-Advaitites. They have a lot of discussions about this, all very intellectual. There are a lot of people reading books and, and arguing about it and debating about it. But once you've had this experience and you know the difference, all inquiries cease. You don't need to inquire anymore. It doesn't mean that you're done, but you don't need to keep asking or debating or having intellectual discussions because now you know it. You have seen it one time or maybe more often and then the inquiries will cease. So we say sometimes in our tradition that it's not like all the questions will be answered. It is that the 
the questions drop away. The questions just seem to disappear or dissolve. So when you realize the distinction between these two, you are free. So the last verse in this group of verses about the relationship between the mind, buddhi and the seer, the last verse says, then the mind inclines towards discriminative knowledge and naturally gravitates towards liberation. Okay, Valya. Having seen this very clearly, the distinction between Purusha and Buddhi, the mind moves towards liberation. It loses interest in worldly activities. It doesn't mean that a person does not do his duty, but he does it in a different way. He's unattached. Does it with vairagya, and his mind is now inclined inwards, not outwards. We can use our diagram here again, and we see that for most of us, the mind is always moving outwards towards the world, body, and world. That's what we keep ourselves busy with. And this is called Pravritti Marg. And when, for whatever reason, in however manner, one has seen, has a, had a glimpse of this and understood that pure consciousness or center of consciousness is different from buddhi that is somewhere in the mind here, then person starts moving inwards. He is constantly seeking to go inwards and know himself, to get back to that beautiful state of beauty and joy that he experienced then. And that is known as Nivritti Marg. Sorry, yeah, Nivritti Marg. What we should learn, however, to do finally is both. You don't have to give up your body, but you learn to live both in the world and yet above it. Learn to witness and not be disturbed by the world around us. And that is Puranamag. Any questions about this? Yes, Balaji, I have a question from last week. It was mentioned that a person who has purified and completely sattvic needs a different form to live out his fine samskaras. Um, there was no such thing. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I see what you mean, that when you're more sattvic, you need a different form? I'm not quite getting it. I think you're referring to the fact that we talked about that everybody has some scar, uh, has tamas, rajas, and sattva. Nobody is purely sattvic. If you were purely sattvic, then you would be done. You would be liberated. But, and then buddhi sattva would recognize the distinction from pure consciousness, but we are mixed most of the time. And when we purify ourselves and consciousness expands, we move to the next level of consciousness. We get a finer mind, finer body, a healthier mind and a healthier body, for example, a privileged birth. There are different kinds of human beings, right? Some are um, not not having certain abilities, you know, they they have a different level of consciousness. They're simply not so aware. But as one purifies and awareness increases, it will have also an impact on the body.
The second part of the question was as long as one holds the human body, does he or she still carry Rajas and Tamas? Yes. We, we have all three. The body is, for example, more tamasic. The mind is more rajasic. And the center of consciousness is sattvic, pure sattva. And we are mixed. Compared to animals and plants, for example, plants are more tamasic, animals are more rajasic, and human beings are more sattvic. So we are all made up of the three gunas. There is no escape from that. It's only when we learn to witness being established in the center of consciousness that we acquire param vairagya and that we are free or liberated. Okay. So, please remember, next time our very last session will be on Saturday at the same time. Nice to have you folks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, Perry. Bye, Joanne. Anita. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Manisha. Bye, Rakesh. Bye, Debbie.